Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. Before we start, can we just talk about how absolutely ridiculously wonderful this shirt is? It makes me so happy. It's from Zara. It's ridiculous. I saw it and I was like, it's both beautiful and hideous at the same time and I have to have it. I feel like since I started on YouTube, I'm less afraid of kind of just being myself now and especially with my clothing choices they've got a lot more daring and now I'm like you, you know in the past I would see all these like amazing clothes and I'd be like they're beautiful but I don't have, have anywhere to wear them or they're beautiful but they're not for me or they're beautiful but I don't have the confidence to wear that and now I'm just like screw it I'm gonna wear it, I'm gonna own it, it's gonna be amazing I mean look at this, it's oversized, it's bright, it's beautiful it, it's everything. Also, koalas and cocktails and plants. It's like all of my favorite things in one shirt and yellow. <sighs> anyway, enough of that. Today we are gonna be talking about bad poetry again. So I wanna make sure I'm not like repeating myself in my videos, but what I will say now is that my inspiration for this video was seeing a tweet from Gabby Hanna. And now I don't just wanna become a channel that just like, it's like, ooh, Gabby Hanna sucked. No, I talk about so much more than just that. And I also talk about good poetry, don't I? Yes, yes, and things that I like. And there's a whole playlist of happy, positive things if you wanna go check it out. I'm very aware I don't wanna make this video or any of my content all about Gabby because I know she's going through a tough time at the minute. I know she's kind of struggling and I don't wanna to add to that. But, so yesterday or the day before or whenever it was, she released a tweet about a poem that I had a huge, huge issue with in my first video on her poetry. And, it kind of got me thinking. Um, I, I didn't really respond to the tweet at first when I first saw it, I was like, whatever. But it kind of stuck in my head and it got me thinking. And I kind of want to talk about this whole topic of like what makes a poem bad and how some people use allusions in a good way or a bad way and how putting your personal life into your poetry can be a great thing or a really terrible thing. And also the difference between things like art and merchandise. And Gabby Hanna's poem is the perfect example to talk about this with exemplifies all my thoughts, it's a really good jumping off point, and so that is why we're going to be talking about it today. The poem that I'm referring to is called Cut, and it's one I touched on briefly in my first poetry video, and if you don't know the poem, if you don't know what my initial reaction was, I'm going to insert a clip now for you to hear it and see how I felt about this uh, however long ago it was, eight months, something like that. The last poem I want to talk about in this video is one that made me angry and it's called Cut. Now this isn't just a poorly crafted poem, it's insensitive. She pulls some stupid bait and switch with, ooh, she's talking about self-harm. Oh no, wait, it was just a haircut. Ha, 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 ha. Let me read it to you. Cut. Her hand trembled around the sharp, cold metal as she looked at her distorted face in the mirror. Just do it, she told her reflection. Don't do it, her reflection replied. Come on, pussy, she shouted at the glass. You're gonna regret this. You always do, the glass warned back. No one gets a shit if I do it, she reminded them both. This is a permanent decision based on a temporary emotion, the mirror pleaded. Hair grows back, dumbass. Snip. As someone who has issues with self-harm, the fact that it's reduced to a cheap joke, a stupid twist, and is compared to a haircut, upsets me. And I honestly find it incredibly disrespectful. Yeah, that's all I'm gonna say about that one for now. So I didn't talk about this poem in much detail at the time because honestly, it, it genuinely upset me. It was the one poem in the book that genuinely hurt me. I found it hard to read, never mind talk about. Even now, this is <laughs> a little bit difficult. Um, a lot of the work in that book was laughably bad and people mocked it, um, kind of rightly so. I critiqued it, I said what was bad about it, what was good about it, what could be done better about it, but this one I didn't talk about in much detail because it felt like I was being personally mocked, my experiences were being used as a joke and a punchline. It felt like someone was coming up to me and laughing at me and slapping me in the face. I wish I was exaggerating. So to summarise, what I took away from her poem after multiple readings was that self-harm to Gabby is a punchline. 
it's something for shock value, it's something to play with, it's there for laughs, it's there for an interesting twist. And as someone who has struggled with self-harm for over a decade now, and honestly I still do, it hurt me a hell of a lot. Th at the time when I first read that poem, I was coming out of a really rough patch um, where I'd been doing it a hell of a lot. Now I'm at a point where it's less. It's been about three weeks since I last did it, and before then it was nearly a month. So, y you know, I'm, I'm getting better, I'm in a better place now. This is one of my high points, you know, as opposed to like six years ago when it was every day, two, three times a day. So as someone who's been personally affected by this, and also a poetry lover, it hurt. And that's not to say all poetry about self-harm or that references self-harm makes me feel that way. I've spoken a lot about Simon Armitage's poem I Say, I Say, I Say before, which touches on the topic of self-harm, depression, suicide, but does it in such a fantastic way. He uses this voice of almost like a comedian talking to a big crowd or someone trying to kind of like get everyone riled up and being like, okay, who here has felt like this? And he takes this very kind of light, jovial tone and turns it into something really serious and deep. And he's taking something that only maybe a few people have done, but that everyone can relate to in some way. He takes quite a taboo topic and brings it to the masses and talks about it in a, it in a way that is heartfelt, but that everyone can relate to. Gabby didn't do that and that's why it hurt. That's why I love Simon Armitage's poem and I was disgusted by Gabby's. So I recently saw a tweet from Gabby and it was a response to another tweet and I don't know what that tweet was because the person then deleted it, probably because Gabby has a pattern of taking her millions of fans and sending them after smaller creators. Look what she did to Hello Leash recently. That was disgusting. I don't like how Gabby targets smaller creators and then paints herself as the victim. Not the point here, just saying I do have those issues with her. But to talk about the poetry because that's what we're here for. Gabby responded to someone who apparently was critiquing that poem um, by basically saying her poem cut isn't offensive because it's about a very specific moment in her life and therefore it can't be offensive. The problem is, this moment she's talking about, apparently Gabby was saying she felt suicidal and she dealt with it by cutting her hair. That narrative is not clear in the poem. That moment in her life is not made clear in the poem. And the thing is, Gabby saying, well, it's not offensive because I meant this, it doesn't matter. You don't get to decide what someone else is offended by. I'm gonna keep saying this. As someone who suffers from issues with self-harm, specifically cutting, you don't get to tell me that I shouldn't be offended by a piece of work using my specific mental health issue as a punchline. And you don't get to say that to anyone else either. The poem is offensive. And Gabby is saying, it's not offensive if you know this one specific story from my life. The problem is, it's offensive because that specific story is not alluded to anywhere in the poem, anywhere in the book, and apparently nowhere online other than this one specific tweet which was published years after the book was released. Let's put emotions to one side for a minute and talk about the theory here. As Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message and this is a popular media theory which I've spoken about in other videos. There's one video in particular in which I cover it in a lot more detail, specifically in reference to some Jordan Peterson stuff and some other books and so on. I'll link that down in the description below if you're interested. It's quite an old video now, I'm not sure how good a job I did, but it does talk about this in more detail if you want to go see it. Marshall McLuhan was speaking specifically about kind of more mass media, so things like, uh, you know, radio versus TV and so on and film and whatever. And while he was kind of talking more about media in that sense, I do think it applies very appropriately to poetry as well. To give you a very oversimplified brief summary of what Marshall McLuhan spent a whole book talking about, basically he believed that studying how a message was shared was just as important, if not more important, than what the message was. He thought that how a message was put out there was often more important than the intent of the message. And I want you to remember this because we're going to be touching on it again in a little bit. But it also links a hell of a lot to a theory that Stuart Hall put forward in the early 70s, I want to say about 73, about encoding and decoding messages in media. So Gabby might now come forward and say, well, the intent was that my message was to say I was hurting so I cut my hair. 
but the way this message is portrayed in her poem, through her poem, distorts this completely and it ends up reading as let me make a joke out of people struggling with self-harm and make it about something which many people see or perceive as frivolous and superficial. So like I say, this relates back to the whole encoding decoding theory by Stuart Hall. And again, to simplify his theory a hell of a lot, basically th this is a whole media theory about making sure the audience understands your message and again it can be applied to poetry. Oversimplified, but you, the creator, have a message you want to portray to your audience. In order to get it from creator to audience, you encode it into a piece of media. You do this in creating your art and you employ many, many techniques and different things to do this. And depending on what your media is, what the medium is, there'll be different ways to encode your message. So it could be lighting in a film, it could be your editing, it could be how you frame a photograph, or in the case of poetry, it's everything that we spoke about in my What Makes a Good Poem video. So it's everything from your choice of words, your structure, your poetic techniques, your rhyme, your rhythm, basically everything that goes into the poem. How you write the poem is how you encode the message. So then your message is encoded, you've created this piece of art and it's pushed out to the public and then the public has to decode it and they do this by looking at all the stuff you put into it and taking it apart, looking at the techniques and saying well what does this mean? In a lot of art this decoding is done subconsciously, you don't even realise you're doing it, which is why people often use certain tropes or well established techniques to relay their message to the audience. For example, you know, high angle shots indicate you have power and the person you're looking at is small and insignificant, low angle shots give the person on camera a lot of power. A well established technique that you don't necessarily consciously decode but you know it's there, it's getting a message across to you. Um, so a lot of these things can be done subconsciously, but often people will want to analyse media further and decode the message further and really pick it apart. Again, with poetry, this is exactly the same. If a piece of art is good, then the audience will decode the same message you intended to encode into it. But if you're not skilled, if your art is bad, if your technique is poor, the audience will likely decode a different message from what you intended. And this is exactly what happened here. Gabby may have intended to encode one message into her poem cut, but the mass majority of the audience decoded a different message and that's why it was offensive. Because her skill wasn't there, her technique wasn't there, the poem wasn't good enough to relay the intended message. Let's look at another example completely outside poetry and look at the absolute cult classic. Hi, doggy. You're my favorite customer. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. People are very strange these days. I used to know a girl. She had a dozen guys. One of them found out about it, beat her up so bad she ended up in a hospital on Guerrero Street. <laughs> what a story, Mark. You are lying. I never hit you. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! It's something. It's a film, it's not poetry, but it's very relevant here. And I choose this because I think it's something that a lot of people know and have heard of, and it's a good example. It was intended by Tommy Wiseau to be a serious, heartfelt drama. And that's what he tried to put into his film. That's what he tried to encode into his work. But because he didn't have the skill, that's not what the audience decoded. Because, you know, there was poor acting, a poor script, poor sound dubbing and so on and so on and so on, the audience decoded a very different message. Instead, they found it hilarious. They didn't see it as heartfelt and serious like Tommy intended. It became this cult classic a bit of a joke. And here it's not the audience's fault for not getting the film's original message. It's not the audience's fault for not seeing it as a heartfelt serious drama. It's the filmmaker's fault for not having the skill to encode his original message and intent properly. And it's exactly the same in Gabby's poem. She didn't have the skill to encode her initial message properly. And so it came across as offensive. And it's not the audience's fault for finding it offensive. It's Gabby's for not having the skill to encode a serious, nuanced message. I, I'm saying message a hell of a lot. And what I find very interesting is even the people who um, didn't find this poem offensive because they saw, you know, at least good intentions in it, most of them, from what they've told me, didn't interpret it in the way that Gabby intended still. 
So for Gabby, she says this is a poem about her thinking about hurting herself, thinking about suicide, thinking about self-harm, and instead cutting her hair. And yet all the comments I got was, oh no, I'm trying to give Gabby the benefit of the doubt. I think it was about how her hair means a lot to her, and so it was a struggle to cut it or not. Either way, the decoded message was not what the encoded message was, and that says a hell of a lot about Gabby's lack of skills. So, not to just like poop on Gabby here, but let's talk a little bit about intertextual references. Let's talk a little bit about allusions in poetry. And this is something that I go into a lot more detail about in my What Makes a Good Poem video. Thoroughly recommend you watch that if you want. It is long, but there are timestamps so you can jump straight to that section if you just wanna hear this bit. They are a central part of poetry. And here Gabby is clearly alluding to a real life event in her work. I say clearly because that's what the tweet suggests, not what the poem suggests. Thing is, allusions only work when it's clear that the author or poet or artist, creator, whatever, is actually alluding to something else. The thing being alluded to must be something that the audience is already aware of or know or can relate to or at least can go and search out and find out about. If you're alluding to something in your personal life, you need to at least let people know what that is. You can't just expect them to know. Knowing the personal story of an artist and why they created something can often add to a good piece of art, but if a piece of art is to be good, it shouldn't need to rely on you knowing something personally about the artist. If a piece of art needs that illusion, that personal illusion to be understood, or liked, or simply not be found offensive, then it's not even a mediocre piece of art. It's a vanity project, a diary entry, a self-indulgent scribble. A critique I often saw of my critique of Gabby's poems was people saying, well, this is a book written for Gabby's fans, not you. As in already established fans, not necessarily people like me who just love poetry. And I found this very interesting because to me that doesn't say this is a poetry book, this is a piece of art, this says to me this is merchandise. And this is something we're gonna talk about in a little bit more detail. Compare this, for example, to Trisha Paytas's poetry book, her um, something like 101 Poems for My Ex-Boyfriend, something like that, right? It's by no means like a good, good poetry book, but it's surprisingly not that bad either. It, I did not expect that going in, and you'll see that if you've watched my video on the book. And the thing is, I know nothing about Trisha's personal life, and I knew nothing going into reading that book. I don't know anything about her drama, her relationships. I don't even know which ex-boyfriend she was referring to in that book, if it was one or many. I knew nothing. But everything I needed to know to understand those poems and enjoy them and get something out of them was contained within the text. I'm sure you could gather extra information by knowing about Trisha's personal life and her personal beliefs and background and whatever, but you didn't need it to get the meaning behind the poem. She managed to encode that meaning and I, as the reader, managed to decode it without any loss of information there. Take another poem by, you know, an actual good poet and an expert, someone like Grace Nichols. Take um, a poem that relays something from her childhood, like Iguana Memory, right? Like, you can read that poem on its own as a self-contained piece and still get something out of it and still understand it and it's still meaningful. Yes, maybe if you know a little bit more about Grace's childhood, why she grew up, what kind of family life she had, blah, 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 her upbringing, you could get a little more out of the poem, but it's not essential to understanding the poem. The poem itself is a self-contained and excellent piece of art in its own right. Again, compare this to anything written by Stephen Fry, for example. People on the whole don't buy his books because of who they are, they buy them because they're excellent pieces of writing in their own right. Saying write a lot, right, 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 right. You could take Stephen's name off the cover and they would still be good. His books like Mythos, his books like um, An Ode Less Travelled, brilliant, wonderful, and you don't need his name attached to them to sell those books. I mean, maybe it helps a bit, but they're still fantastic in their own right. You can't say the same for Gabby's poetry collection. Gabby's name is the only thing that sells that work, not the content. And that's why I don't necessarily class it as a poetry collection, just cheap, thrown together merchandise. And this is back to what I was saying earlier about the medium being the message. Here, the medium is not poetry, it's merchandise. And so now I wanna talk a little bit more about what is the difference between merch and a piece of art in its own right. 
What's the difference between merchandise and a good product? Well, let's look at some examples. I create merchandise on my merch store and I'm not going to pretend that it's art. I do try and make stuff that's going to appeal to a lot of people, but many of the pieces in my merch store, store are related to me, my channel, my brand, my videos, and they'll reference things in my videos like the hormones and demons, um, like sticker, t-shirts, design. That's referencing a video. The that's not how you science is referencing a video. Or stuff like my octopus and jellyfish designs are literally like pieces of art I've done and I think they have more kind of wide appeal. You don't need to have seen any videos, you don't need to know that I love octopuses and jellyfish to enjoy those designs, whereas you do with some of the others. That's why these designs are a class purely as merchandise, because you need to associate it with my brand and my content to understand it. Compare this to uh, someone like, so Marcia, who is PewDiePie's wife, um, she has this whole little like brand that she creates everything for, and I think, I think it's pronounced like my accents, I hope I'm saying that right, um, and in it she creates the most like beautiful, adorable, gorgeous like pottery and jewellery and illustrations and things like that, and even though Marcia is like well known in her own right and she used to have her own YouTube channel, she's married to PewDiePie, blah blah blah. These things are art and products, they're not merchandise because you don't need to know who the creator is to enjoy them. You don't need to know that Marcia made them to know that they're beautiful. You can see the beauty and the skill and the talent in them in their own right. They're art, not merchandise. Gabby's book is merchandise, not art. Again, Stephen Fry's books are not merchandise. Trisha Paytas is a little more unclear. It's a, it's a blurry line there and I'm not sure why I'd call her book at all. <laughs> it's a weird one. But does, does that make sense? It's actually, I'd go as far as to say the same with a lot of Gabby's, at least latest music. Um, I don't really follow her music, I don't really listen to a lot of it, and I don't necessarily enjoy a lot of it, that's just a personal preference kind of thing, but I feel like what I've seen of a lot of her latest songs, they're all referencing her and her brand and her channel and her experiences, and there's not much there that people can get out of it unless you know Gabby and her story personally, which maybe is why I don't really enjoy her music and why a lot of my musician friends are a bit like, what is she even doing? But that's their place to criticise, not me. I'm not a musician. But the point is, if anyone else was singing those songs or had written those songs, they wouldn't have any appeal or meaning, which is why I would essentially class her music as merchandise, not art. And the thing is, like, going back to her original poem, Cut, that we were talking about, you can have poetry that covers and talks about very, very personal experiences and that don't manage to <laughs> offend the audience and that do still have universal appeal. So like I mentioned earlier, Simon Armitage's I Say, I Say, I Say. Um, he has plenty of other poems as well where he talks about very personal experiences like the one about him coming home with an earring one day, like having his ear pierced and how his father reacted to that and stuff. They're, they're very personal poems sharing very personal moments from his life but that still manage to have universal appeal. Again, there's other examples of this. So one that I love is called um, My Body by Abigail Cook and in it it's full of me, my, I, and it's very personal, it's talking specifically about her body and her experience with it, but it manages to have universal appeal still. The difference is, when Gabby writes about her own experiences, I feel like she's writing for herself. It's very very self-indulgent. Nearly every poem in her book, you read them, and you're like, okay, well she wrote this for herself, not for the audience reading it. I don't, I don't think she had an audience in mind when she was writing, I don't think she ever sat and thought, well what is my audience going to get out of this? I think that's very very apparent in her entire collection. I think at most she thought, well what is my audience going to think of me if I write this? Or how am I going to look to people if I write this? I don't think there was ever any, what value does this hold for the audience? There's, there's absolutely no evidence of that. I mean, even in the, the like, response video she did, um, like, in defence of her bad poetry, it was all, my fans will know this, and my fans will see this, and, well, when I was writing this, I was trying to heal myself. It's very clear that her poetry, her writing poetry, her publishing poetry, is a vanity pro project. It's all for herself, it's not intended for others, and that, in my eyes, does make it bad. But in contrast, let's have a look at this one by um, Abigail Cook, which... It's from one of my favourite poetry collections of the minute, right? This is She Is Fierce, it's 
put together by um, Anna Sampson, and it's a bunch of poems all written by incredible female poets about the female experience, and it's wonderful. There's different sections in here about love and friendship and loss and um, empowerment and politics and what it means to be a woman, all different kinds of women, and it's wonderful. It's one of my favourite collections at the moment. Yeah, in this, she manages to be kind of very personal without being alienating to the audience. There's still something that is very universally appealing in here. It's clearly not written for her, even though it's about her. It's written for the reader, to empower the reader, to set a good example for the reader, to share a story with the reader that we can all relate to. My body is the garden I grew up in, with tree trunk legs, lungs made of rose bushes. My ribs are a birdcage, my skin has a sunflower glow. I have planted vines that wrap up my arms and around my thighs. One day I'll teach my children to climb them. My hair is the ocean, every curl another wave to hit the shore of my neck, every freckle a star in the galaxy. I am constellations. My shoulders are bird's wings, my eyes pearls found in, in a sea of storms. My stretch marks are lightning bolts that show I can survive growth. And you don't need to know the poet. You don't need to know, well, where are her stretch marks? How many freckles does she have? Does she have children? Like, you don't need to know that to understand what she's saying. And you don't even need to relate to this personally to relate to her overall message for empowerment. Like, you don't need to have stretch marks to know that she's saying my imperfections make me strong and to take something away from that and feel empowered by it. You don't need to have freckles yourself to know that she's saying, well, this is something that sometimes people try to cover up and that sometimes people mock people for, but I'm gonna embrace it and know that it makes me beautiful and I'm gonna let it shine through. It's a perfect example of a poem that is all about me, 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 I, 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 my experiences, my body that isn't self-indulgent, that is written for the reader and not for the poet. And that's the big difference between a lot of Gabby's works and a lot of good works. And um, yeah. <laughs> To end this, to summarise, that's why Gabby's poem offended me. Because even if it is something she has personally struggled with, you don't get that impression in the writing. Instead, the only thing that comes across is that she's taking something that is a very, very real and still very present struggle for me and a lot of other people. I know a lot of my viewers struggle with it as well. Taking something that is a very real struggle and seeming to mock it, to belittle it, to compare it to something superficial and frivolous like hair. And I know people can say, well, Gabby was very attached to her hair. Gabby had a lot of emotional connections with her hair. Cutting Gabby's hair was a very personal thing to her. It was a struggle for her. But you don't know that in the poem. You don't get that impression. All you get is the impression that she's mocking self-harm, that she's mocking suicide, that she's mocking depression and making it a twist, a punchline, a joke. And that's why it offended me when the medium is the message, when your intended message isn't encoded well enough to be decoded properly and it comes across as offensive, that's not okay. And while intentions do matter, it's different in art because if you don't have the skill to encode those intentions, how do we even know they were there in the first place? All you have in a piece of art is what you can see and in this poem, all I see is something that made me feel like crap. And that's why I, I guess I wanted to kind of, I don't want to drag this topic up again, but I guess that's why I wanted to talk about this today. I guess I just want to say to any of my viewers, because I know a lot of you were hurt by that poem as well, it's okay to be hurt by it. Even if Gabby's intentions were good, you're still okay to feel hurt. I think the response that Gabby should have had to this was, damn, I'm sorry I made anyone feel that way. This wasn't my intention. I'll improve my work in the future. Not well, you read it wrong, it's your fault. But when is Gabby ever gonna learn? Feels like never. She's very defensive rather than taking any constructive criti critique. Oh, I can't even speak at this point. Okay, anyway, I'm I'm done. I'm gonna end this here. Um, end of the month now. So thank you to everyone who submitted your poems for the June theme of the Fresh Poets Society, which was kindness. I am gonna be looking over everything in the forums today. I've been keeping up with it so far and I am so impressed with you guys. So the video um, in which I kind of 
critique and comment on your poems is going to be coming very very soon thank you so much to everyone who submitted it i'm going to be announcing the new theme soon as well that's going to be over on the forums if you want to go check it out at rachelotes.me and then there's a link to the fresh poet society on there um I'm, I'm a little bit of a mess today i didn't get much sleep last night i've not been feeling too well recently because girl stuff so sorry i'm a little bit of a mess sorry i'm a little bit all over the place but hey i'm wearing a fun bright shirt so all the good stuff right <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna go edit this and have something to eat and um, try and be a little less emotional. But thank you so much for watching today. I do appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for sticking around. Thank you for hearing me out. Please let me know all of your thoughts in the comments below because I love reading your comments. I love hearing your thoughts and I do read all the comments. And um, yeah, give me your th feedback. Give me your thoughts. I love hearing from you and hopefully I'll see you again very, very soon.